These are just postcards uh, of African-American soldiers. Now, this is common for both white and African-American soldiers. You often have pictures taken and then these pictures converted into postcards. Some of these are dom taken domestically in the States, the training camps. Some of them are taken abroad in Europe, right? These, we believe, are mostly taken in Europe. What's significant about this is about 350,000 African-Americans go overseas to serve in the military, mostly in stevedore, camp laborer, or clerical positions. Americans were very of two minds of African-American military service. When they drafted them, on the one hand, uh, whites, particularly in the South, said, well, my, my white son, he's not going to war while you stay home and, you know, you slack. So, we're, so actually, African-Americans were drafted at about roughly 13%. In, about 13% of the military is African-American, despite the fact they only make up 10% of the population. You can say the same thing for immigrants as well. There was a big fear that immigrants were going to shirk their duties. So they're, they, even though they make up uh, roughly, I think they end up being drafted at like 18%, even though they only make up 15% of the population. So uh, what's, what this demonstrates is this kind of two-mindedness. On the one hand, we're going to discriminate against you. On the other hand, there's no way we're not going to make you go to war also. Uh, what's notable, too, is that they're wearing their uniforms. When they were in training camp in the South, they could not wear uniforms because there was a fear that it would cause too much disruption among the Jim Crow residents which is to some, probably to some extent the truth, particularly when many soldiers returned home, wore their uniforms, and were targeted for harassment, violence, and even lynching in, in many places, particularly in the South. It's also worth noting that while they're at the front in France, they have this different experience about be, in regards to being black. France had its own racial issues. They had colonized parts of Africa. They have, a number of, they have hundreds of thousands of colonial soldiers fighting in the war for them. They have, their, as noted, they have their own issues about race. However, the lines of segregation in France were simply not as stark and really much looser. So these African-American men, they go overseas, and instead of l living under Jim Crow laws as they had in America, they have much more freedom. They can date white women rather freely. It's not a big deal to the French. It is a big deal to their white counterparts, and you find dozens of accounts of white soldiers openly lamenting this fact and saying things like they don't know their place, that sort of thing. This, of course, drives many of these African-American soldiers to a real place of consciousness in regards to race. So many of them will return home and become active in the civil rights movement, whether they join the NAACP or they join more militant organizations like the League for Democracy. Many of the leadership, the leadership of the League for Democracy, which was a much more militant organization uh, that pushed for African-American rights and veterans' rights, will be veterans. Charles Hamilton Houston, as noted before, is another prime example of this. So the, we believe these postcards not only capture this experience at the front and their service to the military, but also kind of hint at these larger changes that were unfolding, even if they were unfolding in a halting, uh, unsatisfactory manner for our perspective today. Related to this is the fact that there were about 40 or 50,000 soldiers that do serve in combat positions uh, for the French. They were. Uh, from the 369th, the 370th, 371st, and 372nd. The 369th, sometimes known as the Harlem Hellfighters or the Harlem Rattlers, also happened to house the band of Lieutenant James Reese Europe. This was a regimental band that played a lot of jazz and ragtime tunes. And they are the most famous of a number of African American bands, uh, regimental bands from the military, that go around France and basically play for not only uh, French, Italian and American soldiers, and sometimes even German prisoners of war, uh, but also visiting American journalists, such as Irving Cobb. The impact of this is that it spreads American jazz to Europe and really popularizes this form of music. So African Americans not only serve in the war physically, they kind of convey what some, and this is a debatable point, but it is claimed, what some argue is America's only cultural comp contribution to international, the international scene, which is jazz. So in its own way, War I not only facilitates the civil rights movement domestically, 
but culturally because the idea of jazz was that now you have, all, you have whites and blacks, Europeans and Americans, sharing space, enjoying the same kind of cultural moment. And that is significant for a number of reasons. You might compare it to rap, what rap was in the 90s for American culture in bringing white suburbanites into conversation with more urban African American populations and what that's done culturally as well. Thank <laughs> you.